I'm Emily Moses, the Executive Staff Advisor for the Kentucky Arts Council, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to be with us today, Arts Education Day in Kentucky. The Kentucky Arts Council has a slate of top-notch presentations and panel conversations planned for you this week, and we welcome you to join us as you are available throughout the entire week to learn together and celebrate the arts in all their forms in the Commonwealth. We invite you to use the chat to engage with our presenters and one another and to ask questions. We will also be broadcasting live on Facebook each day and that feed is being monitored by our staff. So if you're joining us on Facebook and have questions, please feel free to drop them there and they will be communicated to us to pass along. One final note, we are captioning our presentations this morning. Uh, so make sure if you would like to view the captioning that you look for that in the lower right hand um, corner of your screen. You should be able to turn that on. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, Chris Cathers, who is going to offer a land acknowledgement before we get started. Thank you, Emily, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We are so excited to have you be a part of this. On behalf of all the staff at the Kentucky Arts Council and our board, I want to present you with today's land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. Today, we stand on ground occupied by ancient peoples whose history has been lost, but whose legacy remains. The evidence of these ancient people can be seen all over Kentucky through the mounds and artifacts left behind. Today, over 170 American Indian tribes are represented by their members living and working in the Commonwealth. Let us honor those who were here and those who are here now and build on the legacy of stewardship of the land that they left for us unto the seventh generation. All right, now I turn it over to Samuel. Thank you, Chris. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for joining us for the first day of Arts Week in Kentucky. Uh, my name is Samuel Lockridge, and I'm the Arts Education Director at the Kentucky Arts Council. And today is uh, Arts Education Day. Uh, and I can't think of a better way to kick off the morning than by uh, hearing from some arts education professionals around the state. We have a, a fantastic lineup of panelists today. We have Nick Kovalt from the uh, Governor's School for the Arts, Dele, uh, sorry, Natalie Gabbard from Partners for Education at Berea College, uh, Delair Rowe of Arts for All Kentucky, John Strobe from the Kentucky Music Educators Association, and Jane Dewey from the Kentucky Coalition for Arts Education and Kentuckians for the Arts. So. Uh, I have a few questions that I'll pose to the panel, and then um, we'll hopefully have a few minutes for Q and A at the um, at the end from our audience. So, and you can post those in the chat. So, let's get started. So, um, panelists, good morning. First off, um, I'd like to ask you all just to um, describe the work that your organization does in in the field of arts education and what role you play in it for anyone who may be unfamiliar. So. Um, let's start, we'll go around, let's start with you, Nick. Great, thanks, Samuel, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real honor to uh, be on this panel, um, and uh, thank you to the Kentucky Arts Council for all that you're putting together this week. It's uh, such a great collection of programming. Uh, so my name is Nick Kovalt. I'm the director of Kentucky's Governor's School for the Arts. Uh, we are mostly known for our summer program, and we, our summer program is a three-week residential uh, arts program for rising juniors and seniors in high school. Um, so when students participate in our program, they're participating in an immersive uh, experience in uh, one of nine art forms, although we also emphasize interdisciplinary collaboration as well. So um, we're spanning everything from architecture and design to creative writing, dance, musical theater, um, drama, and also notably uh, here, right here in Kentucky, we are um, arguably the only arts program of our kind that's still tuition free across the entire country. Um, so that's a, a real point of pride for all of us as Kentuckians. Um, beyond our program, uh, we work to stay with our alumni to help support you know, abundant trajectories for them as artists. 
Um, and at the end of the day, we want our students and our young Kentuckians to know that um, they are artists, that it's okay to take on that identity, um, and as artists, that they are important and they are powerful, and that their creative talents are going to um, benefit themselves and also their communities for many years to come. So we just want to set them on um, the best possible trajectory, uh, whatever their artistic career ends up looking like. Thank you, Nick. Um, let's go over to Natalie. Thank you so much. I'm Natalie Gabbard. I'm the project director for Arts and Humanities with Partners for Education at Berea College. And our organization offers a number of educational support services in 31 counties in Appalachian, Kentucky. Uh, we include arts education as one of our strategies. Uh, as part of that, we offer direct services. Um, so that would include uh, residencies and partner schools and community organizations with our roster of teaching artists. Uh, we also offer support for field trips to museums and other arts related uh, venues. And we're also providing capacity building services. So training for partner educators and in arts integration and training for partner teaching artists as well. And then we're also doing some systems alignment work in our area, some collective impact efforts and bringing various stakeholders together um, and we're also helping to nurture some partnerships between regional artists and partner schools and community organizations in our service area. Wonderful. Thank you, Natalie. Um, uh, Del Air, how about you next? Let's see. Um, I am muted. Yes, I am. Thank you to the Kentucky Arts Council for inviting me to take part in this uh, panel discussion. Um, arts for All Kentucky is an arts and disability organization, and we provide accessible and inclusive arts programs uh, to schools, community centers, arts organizations, disability organizations, hospital libraries, whoever wants to work with us. We're pretty much open to partner and those um, programs are serving um, pre-K uh, pre through 12 students with and without disabilities and adults with disabilities. And uh, we're an arts with an S organization because uh, uh, we uh, have artists working with us uh, who are musicians, visual artists. Uh, we work at in the areas of drama, storytelling, literary arts, dance, and media arts. And uh, um, we've even had one uh, request for the culinary arts. So again, we are open to finding ways of, of making things happen. And my role as the uh, director uh, beyond administrative duties is uh, primarily as a coordinator. So I spend a lot of time, especially lately, uh, encouraging people and uh, <clears throat> encouraging them to collaborate. And, and I try to assist them in any way possible uh, because I, want them to use our services. And uh, um, that might include making introductions and uh, always follow up. That's always important too. Thank you. Thank you, Del Air. Um, John. Sure, thanks. Uh oh, I just made my notes go away. Let me fix that. There we go. Uh, I, uh, I'm the executive director of the Kentucky Music Education Educators Association. That's a uh, professional association for music teachers in Kentucky. And we're especially focused on the teachers in schools. So band directors, choir directors, orchestra directors, and uh, classroom music. Teachers of, of elementary and middle school music classes are members of the association. And our mission is to serve them as they try to serve their students. As a nonprofit entity, our policy is established by an elected board of directors and as executive director, I execute and enforce policy. And I administer the association's activities and events. For example, we run the state marching band championships and an annual professional development conference uh, and also music assessments in the spring for individuals and, uh, and groups of students. Wonderful, thank you, John. And finally, Jane. 
Well, thank you, Samuel. Um, and thanks to the Kentucky Arts Council for doing this. And uh, it's great to see all of my fellow panelists on the screen with me today. We, you guys bring such a wealth of experience in arts education to, uh, to this discussion. Um, I'm gonna speak just briefly on two organizations. And then of course you see me surrounded by paraphernalia because I'm in my office as the director of arts education for a school system. So I think we all wear multiple hats, but I'm gonna to speak to the Kentucky Coalition for Arts Education first. Uh, we are an organization that provides a unified voice for arts, edu arts education advocacy in Kentucky. And we have representatives from all of the four major arts education organizations, KMEA, which John just spoke about, uh, KYAEA, which is the Art Education Association, Kentucky Shape, which includes dance, and KTA, the Kentucky Theater Association. And then we liaison with the other organizations as well. So we, um, we strive to present a unified voice for all art forms, advocating for strong quality, arts education for all Kentucky students. Um, we do everything from follow legislation and policy making to providing trainings and summits. Um, we speak before the Kentucky Board of Education on issues. We liaison and communicate with the Kentucky Department of Education also on arts education issues. So um, that's, that's where our main focus is. And Kentuckians for the Arts, which is a relatively new organization. And if you're here on Wednesday, which I, is the advocacy day. Um, you're gonna learn a lot more about CAFTA at that point, um, but they are an arts education advocacy organization that includes arts education, um, but also includes advocacy for individual artists and arts organizations. So thank you. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, so zooming out now, what, what is um, kind of the current status of arts education in Kentucky, in your opinion, um, and specifically thinking about policy that impacts your work in your organization? Um, so let's go back to Nick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, for the Governor's School for the Arts, I think it's important to acknowledge that the lens that we um, kind of interact with uh, arts education in Kentucky, which is that usually we are um, working with students in their sophomore or their junior years as they prepare to apply for the Governor's School for the Arts. Um, you know, we are located outside of the education department. Um, so while I like to uh, think that we are very much in the community of arts education in Kentucky through our relationships that we have with, with educators and organizations across the state, in some ways we have sort of a, what feels like an outside uh, looking in uh, perspective on this. And um, something that we certainly knew before the pandemic, but is definitely true now, um, and that I suspect that a lot of people in this panel would agree with me on, is that um, access to artistic training um, across Kentucky is extremely desperate. Um, and so that is, um, I, I think, an area where our policies that we put in place can, can definitely help us, um, you know, address needs and, and concerns. But um, you know, it's very obvious to us that we are often seeing not just a student as they are in their sophomore or junior year of college, but we're also getting uh, kind, of, kind of connected to what they did, didn't have access to in elementary school and middle school, um, both inside and outside the school system. So um, I think, uh, you know, that, that disparate nature of arts training is, is a big issue. Um, you know, the pandemic has been a big interruption. I think um, this is not policy related necessarily, but we are all so distracted right now, understandably. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, I think some relationships and, um, and kind of being uh, partners to each other is really strained by that, not because we don't want to be more connected, but because we're all just trying to um, focus on, you know, our desk and our issues at hand. So um, what is very, very clear to me, though, is that all is not lost. There are a lot of success stories in our applicant pool this year for the Governor's School for the Arts. Um, anecdotally, I will tell you, we don't feel like we have seen um, less quality work from our students this year, even though they're now going a year into virtual learning. Um, so I think that that says a lot about the success of our students and also our educators who are just doing an amazing, amazing job right now. So um, I just have to give a shout out to any art teacher watching this um, because you all are really making it happen. So I'll pause there. That's great, Nick, thank you. Uh, Natalie. Thank you. I'll just echo what Nick said in terms of um, access to arts education programming being desperate. Um, our team crunched some numbers recently and um, sort of not surprisingly, um, 
found out students in our in our service area have um, a higher percentage of um, reporting zero uh, uh, visual performing arts courses um, and also at limited access to visual performing arts teachers. So um, the situation in our area is uh, worse compared to the rest of the state as far as access and opportunity goes, but we are um, aware that our schools are facing impossible decisions, um, especially right now. And um, despite the, the many uh, challenges that COVID crisis has brought our way, I'm encouraged to see our partner schools doing what they can to continue to offer arts programming. Um, many uh, students have uh, been able to access virtual arts programming in an after school type setting um, just because of the arts champions in our service area. Um, but I would say the situation in terms of access and opportunity really is bleak in our area. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. Uh, Del Air? Uh, yes. Um, I guess the general feeling that, you know, I have and that uh, I, I read in communicating with different people is that everybody's just kind of hanging on at this point. I mean, oftentimes uh, people that are working in the arts feel like that anyway, but again, that's just compounded under the current circumstances. Uh, and um, Arts for All Kentucky, like a lot of arts organizations, is a nonprofit. And uh, one of our largest uh, contracts is with the Kentucky Department of Education uh, Office of Special Education and Early Learning. That's a long, a long title. But I say this because just like we are an arts and um, disability organization, we're talking about, and there's like a crossover. Here's another crossover, arts education, these two different things. Are depend, I mean, we are dependent on education, the support of education. Without the support of education and educators, we're up a creek. So uh, uh, first and foremost, we need the support of educators because our resources are, are for teachers. And if teachers aren't supported, they're not going to be using us or they can't use us as a resource. So um, we are very dependent upon um, the support of education in Kentucky generally across the board. So uh, we are um, we are an advocate. Uh, we're primarily programs, but advocacy is interwoven with everything we do. Uh, we are an advocate for the importance of the arts uh, because the arts uh, are a tool. Some people don't maybe want to consider that, but uh, in terms of education and a lot of other things, arts are an important tool for education, uh, for uh, cultural awareness and identity of citizens, uh, for student retention, for uh, tools for inclusion and diversity, uh, as well as arts for art's sake. So uh, um, we're, you know, uh, behind in and support strong uh, educational policies uh, because we believe that the arts, um, that equals the arts are strong educational policies equal strong citizens, strong educational policies equals a strong workforce, strong educational policies uh, equal strong communities and strong economies. And all of these things rolled together equal a strong society as a whole. And we are an important part of that. Thank you. Yeah, well said, Delaire. Um, let's go over to John. Sure, sure thanks, Samuel. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, arts education is struggling in the state, and it's not just because of the pandemic, although I think for especially the performing arts, the pandemic hits really, really hard as compared with almost all areas of education. I think I could teach an online math class a whole lot easier, and I'm not a math teacher, but I think I could teach an online math class a whole lot easier than I could teach an online band or choir. Uh, I, just the nature of it, the, the fact that it's ensemble work so often, 
theater is the same way. It's ensemble work so often that it's made it really tough on us. But we're going to get out of this. You know, we're on the downward slide. We know. And that's good. So it, with a broader view uh, that there are a couple of concerns because um, there have been a, a great deal of, uh, well, non-action by some of the leaders in education over the past time. It may be people who are currently still in position or it may be their predecessors. But as of the passing of the Kentucky Education Reform Act in 1990, time in the arts for elementary students is not protected in, for, for Kentucky students. It used to be that they were guaranteed they would have X amount of time in music or what, this kind of thing. And it's not there. And we, uh, the, the coalition, the Kentucky coalition that uh, Jane uh, facilitates, we uh, did a really strong push for some legislation that would correct that and made a lot of compromises as you always do and took away things, but still tried to get it through that there would be some protection, maybe a hundred minutes a week in art, if I, if I remember correctly. And uh, there were some entities, some folks that, that just didn't want to give any further weight to the arts, feeling apparently that it would take away uh, from emphasis on other areas that they wanted to, uh, wanted to stress. So that was, you know, there, here we sit, kids may or may not get arts in their education and there's nothing to say that they have to. And the second thing, it's a big thing, is that since 2018, there's been no art specialist on staff in the Kentucky Department of Education. Now, without an informed internal voice watching for and serving arts education, Kentucky's at a tremendous disadvantage. You've just got to have that. And we, uh, we've not had the opportunity yet, honestly, with the way things are, to, uh, to meet uh, Commissioner Glass and and share our feelings about this and uh, try to make a case for that. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty bad that we don't have that. Yeah, excellent points, John. Um, Jane. So I'm gonna turn the tide just for a moment and say, um, I am hopeful for arts education in our state. Um, I, I see committed and talented arts educators in the classroom. I see organizations like the ones represented by the faces on my screen right now that strive to work every day with those educators, um, community organizations, individual artists to actually provide that opportunity and access. And I'm also hopeful because of the things that the four people who just went in front of me said. In order to remain hopeful, we have to recognize what our issues are and talk about them frankly and meet them and see what we can do to go there. And that's why the, it's so important for the coalition to speak with one voice. So arts educators from music, theater, dance, visual arts speak together and speak um, about the same things because what we want is arts for our students. Now, um, I'll go back to Samuel's original question about policy. Um, I really see four areas of policy that we kind of work with and you'll forgive me for getting down in the weeds for just a moment, but um, something that's very important that stands in the Kentucky Revised Statute and I'm gonna read this from my notes so, you'll, um, so I'll make sure I get it correctly. Um, the General Assembly finds, declares and establishes that schools shall develop their students' ability to express their creative talents and interests in visual arts, music, dance, and dramatic arts. So policy like Kentucky statutes is there and drawing people's attention back to that fact is important. Um, we have the National Arts Standards, were, which were adopted by Kentucky, I believe, and John will correct me if I'm wrong here, 2014-ish. Um, they are actually up for revision, it's my understanding, in the next school year, 21-22. They set very high standards for arts education for our students. There's, they are standards every year, actually from PK up to grade eight, and then three levels at the high school level. And those standards provide guidelines for teachers to both instruct from and to bring their students to, right? So there's, there's the standards. Um, there's certification. 
that's a policy area that we don't always get into, um, but having teachers that are trained in the methodology of teaching the visual and performing arts is essential for strong arts education in our state. Um, and so certification is another area of policy and K through five classroom teachers are certified to teach any arts area in their classroom. Um, in middle and high school, you go up to having to have specialized teachers in um, the areas of visual, visual art and music, um, but in the areas of theater and dance, you can have PE certification or English certification. So um, while I'm not saying that teachers who are certified in other areas can't teach the arts, I do think that certification that says training in methodology and teaching the arts is essential is what would drive us. And then um, John mentioned this accountability. You know, where are we in holding ourselves accountable for bringing these programs to all students, for engaging all students to the level that the National Arts Standards brings us to. Um, and we are, um, we're not doing great on that front. Um, and so we need to look to policy that can help us address that. And as John mentioned, the coalition worked on a bill called the Arts Equity Act, um, trying to mandate some time. There is a requirement at the high school level that all students have one credit in the visual and performing arts, either through a specialized arts course or through a broad generalized history and appreciation of the visual and performing arts. Um, so there's that accountability there. Schools are also asked to um, provide assurances of what they are teaching in the arts and who, who teaches that um, annually. Um, but again, accountability is an area we could really strengthen. So I'll pass it on now, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, so moving on now, what, tell, me, tell us about what are your organization's goals um, for arts education in the next like five years? Um, and what are the greatest barriers to achieving these goals? Um, so let's go back to Nick. Sure, um, you know, in the next five years, uh, I, I really hope that we can continue to try to address an issue that uh, we, we've been addressing for a while, which is just scarcity of our resource. What I mean, mean by that is, um, you know, the Governor's School for the Arts, uh, I think it's an amazing program, I'm pretty biased. And we can only provide it to 256 high school students every summer, which is an insanely low number, given the need in the state. Um, it's, it's a great number when you look at our history, it's the largest our program's ever been. Um, but uh, as, as we have been hoping for, for a number of years, but uh, I hope we think we can uh, find new levels of commitment to this beyond the pandemic, we have got to provide our resource to more students in the state. Uh, and that doesn't just have to look like our summer program, um, but you know, in terms of our summer program, I'd love to see us operating on at least two college campuses in the summer. I'd love to see us expand the art forms that we offer. Um, so not only that we're you know, taking more um, you know, classical musicians, um, but that were, you know, Delaire brought up the culinary arts. What about our, you know, young culinary artists in the state? What about students and dances, <clears throat> dance forms other than, you know, ballet and modern, which we current, currently focus on? Um, so I think we really have to um, broaden what we can bring to students and do it in a way that is relevant to where they are in 2021 uh, and what this world is gonna call on um, for them as artists in, in, in the future. Um, so uh, how we can uh, continue serving the, the students, not just a way that is relevant, but in a way that is truly abundant um, is, is really important to us in, in the next five years. Awesome, Nick. Um, Natalie? Thank you. Uh, so I would say our goals ultimately are you know, to increase uh, high quality arts opportunities uh, in our service area for students. Um, but what we're working on right now um, mostly involves um, working with uh, our schools to nurture partnerships with regional artists and community organizations. Um, I mean, we're in a situation right now where, you know, I'm not sure our schools are ever going to adequately be able to support high quality arts education on their own. And so we're looking to uh, regional arts partners um, and arts organizations to help support our schools in providing those opportunities. Um, we're also looking internally uh, within our organization 
We have around 14 uh, grants, most of them funded by the US Department of Education. Um, and within those grants, about three or four of them, we have focused our arts education efforts. And so we're looking to expand our arts programming throughout all of our PFE uh, portfolio. And that includes additional grants we might get in the next five years. Um, and then we are also uh, working right now to develop uh, the skills of emerging teaching artists in our area. Um, last summer, we received support from the National Endowment for the Arts for the Appalachian Teaching Artists Fellowship. And that involves uh, right now five fellows um, in our service area who are about to embark on a learning journey of workshops and mentorship with some uh, teaching artists that are on our roster and also on the Kentucky Arts Council's roster. Um, and they'll be doing practicum teaching experiences in our service area as well, hopefully this fall. Um, so that's that's what we're working on now. Um, it's it's uh, quite a bit daunting, I would say. Our biggest barriers are our uh, really our staff capacity. Um, right now there's, there's just a couple of us working full-time in, in the arts on our staff. So that, that does make things challenging. Funding is always an issue. Um, I think we could probably all speak to that for our organizations. I will say something that in Eastern Kentucky is a, a, a barrier would be our, our infrastructure, especially around transportation for after school arts programming or even um, during the school day to try to do a field experience in the arts. Uh, the transportation can be a barrier just because of our geographic uh, isolation in the mountains. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Um, Del Air. Yes. Um, what is our, what are our goals for the next five years um, and what are the barriers? Well, our, the first thing that came to my mind was our mission. Our goal is always our mission, which is to provide arts and education programs that allow people with disabilities to fully participate in the arts. And uh, um, we want to, and we are a statewide organization, so we want to maintain that, um, that standing to that we are you know, serving the entire state of Kentucky. And in order to do that, uh, I know everybody here will say we need to grow our funding sources and maybe even diversify some of those uh, in order to, uh, as Natalie mentioned, grow staff because we are a one and a half uh, staff. We have one and a half staff, one full-time, one part-time staff member. And we do contract with a lot of artists who actually serve as advocates for us and do a lot of a lot of work, uh, you know, getting the word out there. So, even though they are not staff, they're they're vitally important. Uh, and why do we want to do this? Because we do want to reach more people. There, we want people to know. We want schools, we want teachers, we want community centers to know about us so that we can work with them and provide our services. Uh, we want to continue to train and employ more artists uh, who can, who are capable of, of providing this type of program programming. Uh, and in fact, we do provide programs for students with and without disabilities uh, in inclusive programming. So, uh, uh, Really, our reach is even broader, you know, than uh, one population of uh, people with disabilities. And also, since working for Arts for All Kentucky for a number of years, I've learned that the definition of disability is very broad, too. There are individuals with, uh, I've, there's about 20% of the population uh, nationwide that identifies or have been diagnosed with some type of disability. And in fact, we all might end up with a disability one day. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not uh, an in, um, exclusive to any one group of people. Uh, it crosses all genders, all races, all ethnicities, religious groups, you name it. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, broad topic. And uh, um, so we wanna provide 
more opportunities for artists with disabilities too. We are, uh, a lot of what we do is providing uh, inclusive and accessible programs uh, for students and adults, but we also have a population of artists in our state who themselves have disabilities. And they are very unrepresented and can really use our support. And I would like to grow <clears throat> that uh, those programs even further because we do, people are a lot more willing to give their uh, time and their money for programs for children. And then once, once, once they're out of school, they're sort of like, well, there you go. Uh, you know, it's sort of left up to families and friends to take up the slack after that. Well, these individuals, especially young adults that are transitioning into adulthood, still need support. And so we want to be there for them too. So what are the barriers? I've already mentioned uh, um, funding and Thank you to the Kentucky Arts Council because operational funding is the hardest thing to get. And that is what the Arts Council does for so many arts organizations across the state. Uh, so we need that also, I mentioned for staffing. We could do a lot more if we had more staff. Um, we also, um, a barrier is just, and this is where advocacy comes in, awareness. There's just a lot of people that aren't aware of what we do or what the arts do or what any of the organizations represented here do. So we need more advocacy um, and we need more accessibility. Accessibility uh, now means even more than, <laughs> even more, uh, do students, do people have access to the internet? Are they connected? Can they, you know, take part in, in what we're doing? And then transportation, that is always an issue too. How are, how are students, are people gonna get to the Performing Arts Center? How are they gonna get to the community center to take part in, uh, or the museum to take part in what they have to offer? So those are some of the barriers that, um, that came to my mind. Thank you. Thanks, Delaire. John? Well, um, I saw a quote the other day that's, that's pretty uh, uh, re uh, relevant to what we're going through right now because uh, so often these, you know, we, we run into these barriers that are, are hitting us due to the fact that people can't be together in the same place uh, safely uh, very easily. And uh, the quote was, if you can't run, if you can't fly, run, and if you can't run, walk, and if you can't walk, crawl, but whatever you do, keep moving. And I think that's what the best of our teachers are doing right now. And it's what we're trying to do here in the office uh, of KMEA where we serve them and, and so forth. And I think the next five years, honestly, is going to be a lot of recovery. You I mean, you asked this at a funny time because uh, we, we wanna get our music programs in our schools back to where they were uh, in terms of enrollment and in, chief, and in achievement because both, have, uh, both are suffering right now. Uh, uh, however, I think we'll probably continue to employ some of the remote teaching techniques that we've learned during the, during the past year. Uh, but I think that the recovery, honestly, will take about five years uh, before we go, well, remember that. Uh, barriers are the, the, the standard four uh, that, that uh, are part of any curriculum that support any curriculum, and that's student time, staffing, facilities, and budget. And when any of those is uh, uh, on lower, offered lower than it ought to be, than it could be, well, then, you know, students suffer. It's not, it's not what's best for kids. So those, those four things are, are things to advocate for on the local level. And uh, I think, of course, all of us in, in statewide organizations understand our perspective is broader than that of the, the person in the local area, whether that's a school or the community. And so often, if we can talk to them, we can put them in touch with other people who have overcome some of those kinds of barriers. Uh, so that, that's one thing that I think that we serve. And that's certainly a goal of ours is to uh, connect people that need to be connected. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, John and Jane. Um, 
the coalition actually has three fairly broad priorities that we continually are working on. And the first is to ensure that all Kentucky students have access to standards-based curricular, co- and extracurricular learning opportunities in the visual and performing arts, raising awareness of the benefits of arts education for all students, and advocating to educational decision-making bodies to maintain and grow their arts education programs in the 2021 school year and beyond. So kind of as a subset of that, two things that we're really working on, um, go back to something that John mentioned at the state level, a visual and performing arts program consultant um, and an arts advisory council for KDE. Um, both could do go a long way us towards raising that awareness um, and towards um, advocating for arts education for all students. Um, the biggest barrier, I think most of them have already been said, but I want to echo what Delaire said, because I think recognizing the benefits, and there are tons of benefits of strong arts education, um, until we recognize those and actually really recognize those, um, we are not going to have an educational system that works to meet the needs of the whole child. So in recognizing the um, benefits of strong arts education, we can then work towards an educational system that does truly work to meet the needs of the whole child and all children. Thank you. Great, thank you, yeah. Um, so we're running a little tight on time. I've got a couple more questions I'd like to ask, um, but uh, and I haven't wanted to cut anyone off because you're saying such excellent things. But um, uh, for these last two questions, I, I think we're only going to have time for maybe two um, uh, two answers. So I'm going to pose the question, and if you feel uh, compelled to to answer, please raise your hand, and we'll, and we'll call on two of you. Okay. Um, so I just want to make sure we have time for questions in the chat because there's some good ones. Um, so first of all, so there is there is great economic and racial disparity um, in who has access to high quality arts education. We we're kind of accepting that as a premise. We 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 accept that. Um, what is your organization doing to make access to the uh, to arts education more equitable? I can jump in. Or that's all right. Uh, let's say Nick and then John. Great. Thanks. Thanks for this uh, really great question. I mean, just in terms of, of the Governor's School for the Arts, I think um, first off, when thinking about things um, like like equity, um, like income disparity, you know, racial, um, you know, injustice, uh, we have to start on an individual level with our own hearts and minds before we jump to our organizational level. So I think for us, it's um, starting at the place of where are we as human beings uh, and centering, you know, things like equity and justice um, in ourselves, our work. So um, I think it <clears throat> starts uh, with educating ourselves um, and having, you know, conversations, uh, making sure that those are active topics in our workspaces amongst our colleagues. Um, beyond that, especially at the Governor's School for the Arts, it would be so easy for me to like send out our email about our application being open every fall and just hope that, that email list is big enough. And like, hey, I told you about the program, why didn't you apply? It'd be so easy for me to go on that path. But what we really seek to do is, um, you know, I need to be having uh, two-way conversations and relationships with people who are working with these students on the ground every day. And, and that is in, it's in poor communities. It's in communities of color. It's in, you know, people who are advocating for, um, you know, students who are queer, things like this. So I need to make sure that I am working with the people who are advocating for those students all year long um, on the ground and asking them, hey, what's working for you? What are your, <clears throat> what are your success stories? What are your challenges? Um, let me learn more about your work. And then making sure that they're aware of our work, um, that I'm building the bridges to, to GSA for them and asking them for feedback on our program so that we are remaining responsive. Um, I'll also just mention that, you know, our adjudication process is, is uh, maybe not perfect, but we really are adjudicating students holistically, right? So we are not just looking for the 256 best dancers, most amazing painters, um, best poets you've ever seen. We are convening a community of passionate young artists who are ready to dig into their creativity and to discuss how that can better their communities. And those two things I just, just described are on a Venn diagram with each other. Um, so I think it's really important for us to think about our young artists as holistic human beings and not just as painting producers, uh, you know, 
Um, and I, uh, so that's just very, very important for us. I'll, I'll pause there because I think I can take up the rest of the panel on this topic. That's great, Nick. Thank you. And John. Yeah, that I, I'm going to take Nick's transcript and uh, make a poster out of it or something. That was really, that was really good. The, uh, the thing is, um, it's really become clear, I think, just this past year, more than ever before, it's become clear to anybody who's paying attention that uh, most of us are not doing enough. KMEA has not been doing nearly enough. And, and we're, that's becoming apparent. It's not something we were aware of. We're always trying to do enough in the areas that we're aware that we're not. So uh, a, a awakening consciousness is pretty important. And that's sort of where we are. We've, we have hosted a series of interviews uh, that uh, featured black music educators where they talked about their life experience coming up through their school arts programs. And they're now teaching. And there was a lot to learn there. Uh, and we have, uh, we have plans. Now, you know, plans are, are great until you enact them. But we've, we have had a, an active conversation with uh, my incoming president about assembling a diversity inclusion equity task force in the coming months. And where that'll go, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's obviously something that if you don't, if you don't uh, consciously stay with it and consciously feed it, it just sits still like a lot of things. It's something we're really gonna have to just consciously um, hit on repeatedly and continuously uh, because there, there certainly are problems and uh, young people uh, in uh, other circumstances than just the, the general, you know, the, the, the privileged, they, they deserve and need more. That's so important in education. And it's kind of a, a theme that's run through this whole uh, uh, th talk today. Different people have talked about parts of the state that, for example, that are at a disadvantage in various ways. We, uh, we, we've, we've got to continue to think about it and address it and figure out how. It's not an easy, if it was easy, we wouldn't even have, be having this conversation. It's obviously quite difficult to keep doing the good things we are doing and yet make things more accessible. Great, thank you. Um, and finally, last question. I would like to go around very quickly, five seconds, give me like three words basically that describe um, like if money were no object, um, describe your vision for arts education in Kentucky, just like two or three words. Um, Nick? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say um, that students are empowered to live their fullest lives um, by utilizing their creativity, that they, are, they have permission to do that and wow. access to do that. That's great. Natalie? I would say all emerging artists have mentors. Great. Um, Del Air? Arts for all, not for the few. Absolutely. John? Well, the, the original question, of course, if money were no object, describe your vision for Kentucky education arts education in Kentucky, sorry. Uh, and I thought that uh, one thing is, uh, you know, a full-time informed lobbyist in Frankfurt who understands art on the level of a practitioner, not just someone who knows Frankfurt, but someone who knows arts as well and adequate budgets in each school's um, music program in my case. So economically disadvantaged kids could fully participate. Great, and Jane? Yeah, and if funding was no problem, every student would have multiple opportunities to engage with the visual and performing arts every day. Excellent. So um, I do have a couple of questions here in the chat I'd like to get to. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna kind of combine a couple here that are, are similar. Um, and uh, so one, one big one that I'm seeing is, so are, are some of these programs um, through your organizations are they being offered in any way to students who are learning at home? Um, and uh, to ask uh, another way, um, or yeah, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Are there, is, is any of this available to students who are learning at home? Yeah, Del Air? Uh, 
Yes, uh, and this is this has been our challenge since last year, at just about this time, and uh, we have um, videos posted on our website. We also uh, share those on a YouTube channel and uh, uh, and share about them on Facebook, uh, and we also utilize Facebook and have a weekly. Um, Facebook Live, we call it Studio Live, uh, that people can do from home. And uh, uh, we've also done some even, well, smaller things like um, with Facebook try and with art appreciation and uh, uh, getting people to engage, uh, looking at art and then uh, finding, you know, either doing art themselves or taking photographs and, and reposting on Facebook. Those are uh, a few of the things that we've done so far. We're going to be doing a podcast here pretty soon, which I'm excited about because that's completely new for us. Excellent. Um, so let's see. So, uh, okay, here, so here's a question about, um, sorry, I'm losing it here. Um, so, so regarding disability, um, so a, as Delair mentioned earlier, like um, disability um, is generalizable across race, sex, like all, all of us are vulnerable to, to, to disability. Um, and, and so technology is, is often like one of the, um, the barriers there and, and it's not really included in um, a lot of what, what we talk about, I guess, is access to, to technology. So um, what, uh, uh, so aside from, I know Del Air has been working, doing a lot of work with this. Does anyone have anything to add about their organization and how you're engaging um, people with disabilities? Yeah, John. Samuel, it's, it's kind of, it doesn't feel like it's a great deal of what we do. However, occasionally, for example, we'll have an all state student, uh, who, a student to, uh, that is to say, a student who's a, a auditioned for one of our all state honor ensembles choir, typically. And they, you might find, well, this, this student is highly visually impaired, maybe even to the point of totally uh, blind. What, so certainly we work with that. And uh, they, they're, they've given accommodations if they can sing, if they can sound good, and they just need to learn their music in such a way that they're not having to read it. Perhaps they'll be with Braille or something like that. That's the only thing I can think of that we are in position to actually do. Maybe my, uh, maybe my imagination is limited, though. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, Jane, did you have something to add? I was just going to quick jump up jump in with the idea of teacher training and um, teacher training in pedagogy and methodology. Um, and that teachers who are trained um, in the arts and provided opportunities to learn about and practice methodology and pedagogy in the arts are then better equipped to meet the needs of students with disabilities in addition to the various students that are in their classroom. So this idea of training and certification can be an important piece. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, think I, want to call Nat I want to call Natalie out on this one because we are uh, working with, uh, with her uh, in providing universal design for learning workshops for teaching artists. And that's a follow up on Jane's uh, comment. Excellent. Yeah, Natalie, anything to add about that? Thanks, Delaire. So that's part of that Appalachian Teaching Artists Fellowship work I mentioned. Uh, that'll be one of the trainings that our teaching artists receive. So the fellows and then we're hoping to uh, offer that to all of the artists on our roster. I did want to add, it's not specific to students with disabilities, but it is related to students' access to technology. We have many students in our area who do not have access to um, broadband internet. And um, we have offered some, we've offered a number of different virtual kinds of teaching experiences, but some have been asynchronous where we've 
got some art kits to students and they were able to do activities at home on their time when they could have access or even if they didn't have access to technology. Excellent. Um, and I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, but um, this was fantastic. Thank you everyone so much um, for sharing your perspective. Uh, we're going to take a very quick break and uh, we're going to be back here at 11 o'clock for our next session uh, about the Teaching Artists Guild. So once again, thank you to all our panelists and uh, take a quick break and we'll see you back here uh, in just about five minutes. <laughs>